Hello, everyone. Welcome back to our class. We are nearing the end of the semester, and we're all in that sort of end of the semester state of disorganization. I'm hoping that for you, this class is a little bit less work intensive. Um, next week, I will be giving you a video of how to get an A on the final. This week includes our final discussion post. So we are nearing the end. And as always, if you need help with anything, if there's any stuff getting in the way of your finishing the semester, let me know so I can help you out. So far, everybody's doing pretty well in the class. And yeah, let's just get into it today. Let's continue the conversation we began last week. I'll start by sharing my screen and we'll get going. So what are we talking about today? We are, of course, talking about, and this is lecture 22, preparing for the apocalypse through fermentation. Here's our course textbook, the Noma Guide to Fermentation. I'm back to doing the weird jokes at the beginning. What are we talking about today? This is Science for Policy, Climate Change, Part 2, Climate Action and Ethics Questions. This is a continuation of what we started last week. Last week, I kind of gave you this shattershot approach, scattershot approach to what is climate change? What is climate science? This week, we are looking at more concrete answers to what do we do about it? and the ethics questions inherent to that. So we also have to ask a few other questions like who's most affected by climate change? And we'll be jumping in and out, out of the PowerPoint. Um, I'm re-recording this because the last time I tried it, it wasn't as seamless as I would like. There are some links that take a minute to load. Hopefully they'll load better this time. If they don't, we're gonna keep the lecture the way it is. So in this lecture, first, what is at stake in climate policy discussions? you know, who wins, who loses, who has the most to lose. Then we're going to look at an all too brief overview of options for climate action. And there I'm giving you as much as I can cram into a short video, knowing that this is a whole field of study. And then finally, ethics questions in climate policy, things that really matter when we're looking at, well, what do we do about climate change? So first, what's at stake? And I have three categories here which is who's most affected by climate change, political wins and losses, and human life, or certain ways of living, as in what is at stake here? Are we going to go extinct as a species, or is it just that we have to change how we live? So let's start with who is most affected. Generally speaking, those who are going to suffer the worst effects from climate change are the global poor, especially in the global south, Africa, and coastal communities. Let's open up this link from the IPCC, which of course is one of the largest international bodies on climate change. And this is the link that is not opening as well. So we might not spend as much time with it. Um, they have a lot of images on here. My internet's not doing great today. So this is part of one of their special reports. They do a lot of these. And we'll try and go down to their executive summary just as soon as it loads. Oh, come on, IPCC, don't do this to me. Oh, page is unresponsive. Okay, well, wait a second. There we go. Okay, we're moving now. So what we can see here is that sea levels are rising, which means that there are a lot of communities that are going to, in a certain number of years, end up underwater. The interesting thing with that is that there are communities that are preparing for this now. And in certain parts of the world, what those communities are doing is that they're actually buying land more inland. Inland. I'll link you a piece that was written a couple of years ago um, about a small island nation that is buying up land in another country because climate models are showing that their nation is not going to exist anymore. So what do they need to do? Well, they need to find a place for their people to live. And so they're buying up land in, I believe it's Fiji. That's one solution. Another solution, and they don't talk about it in this report, but I can find you a story on that too, is that in some parts of the US, it's actually not legal to talk about rising sea levels for things like insurance discussion, for insurance policies on coastal areas, because those governments don't want to acknowledge the fact that they might be underwater in a decade or so. I would encourage you to look over this IPCC report. They go into how high will sea levels be if we hold you know, emissions, if we hold climate change to this level or this level. As always, they do some great math. Um, responding to sea level rise, you know, we can look at 
what do we do here? You know, and there's a couple of different solutions that they offer. You know, these responses range from protecting the coast, accommodating things, retreating from the coast, advancing into the ocean by building seawalls, identifying the most appropriate ways to respond is not straightforward. It's an interesting discussion. Then let's see if we can continue. Yes. And here's some other interesting stuff. You know, the, interesting is hard. This is this article that I'm going to link you here is one about, you know, who's most affected. And this goes into how it's about 30% of the global population that's going to be living in a place that's uninhabitable in about, I think it's 2060 or 2070. And so the question becomes, where do all these people go? Because the global population is only getting bigger. And we know that certain chunks of the planet should climate change continue at the rate that it's continuing. Where are folks going to live? And that becomes a difficult question to answer. And this, this article kind of goes into which places on the planet are going to be less inhabitable. I encourage you to read it too. Moving on. Oh, okay. Then the, this New York Times article that I have for you here, and I'm not going to click on it because it's not as interesting, is that realistically, everybody is going to suffer some kind of economic impact. The results of climate change are not good for business. They're not good for economies. Because instead of focusing on things like growing the economy, we end up focusing on survival, which does not do well for everyone's wallet. Then in terms of political wins and losses, there's surprisingly bipartisan agreement on climate change when you look past mainstream media's take on it and really present leadership in either political party. Um, for example, and we're going to try and watch this YouTube video, you might be surprised that someone like Al Sharpton, and actually, I'm just going to show you the video. Get the microphone closer to it. Now, let's face it, we're polar opposites. We couldn't be further apart. I'm on the left, and I'm usually right. And we strongly disagree. Except on one issue. Tell them what it is, Reverend Pat. That would be our planet. Taking care of it is extremely important. We all need to work together, liberals and conservatives. So get involved. It's the right thing to do. Now, there you go again. Join us. Together, we can solve I find that to be an extremely interesting little clip from a few years ago because Pat Robertson and Al Sharpton are not two people who agree on much, but they do have agreement on the topic of climate change, that something is wrong, something needs to change, and there's actions that need to be taken. So as far as these two men are apart on the political spectrum, there's some agreement here that climate change is the problem. This NPR article down here is also incredibly interesting. Um, if you look at it, there's a, an age divide among Republicans, and older Republicans are not concerned about climate change. Younger Republicans are. And so this also becomes a question of, well, is it really a political divide or is it a generational divide? Um, then there's this climate communications report from Yale that you could look into that shows that when you just look at the policies contained in the Green New Deal, which is a big issue that we might not really want to get into here. Realistically speaking, most people are for all of those things. It doesn't have to be the political issue. It doesn't have to be the political divide that we think it is. At the same time, and I've got another link for you down here, the empty radicalism of the climate apocalypse. Uh, this is from an eco-modern perspective. This author's big argument is, look, the the Green New Deal doesn't go far enough. What's contained in the Green New Deal? Well, an infrastructure overhaul, mostly. But what he's saying is, look, if we want to actually deal with climate change, the thing we need to do is to nationalize our energy. Yeah, and so he offers a very different perspective, arguing that, you know, the Green New Deal is largely too capitalist which is interesting because it is proposed as this socialist boogeyman. So then let's talk about human life. What's at stake? Human life or certain ways of living? Uh, do you guys remember that David Wallace Wells piece we looked at last week? His argument in that article was, look, human life is greatly in danger. 
the entire earth is going to be uninhabitable. We're all going to die. Then there's also a guy named Roy Scranton. He's got a book called Learning to Die in the Anthropocene, which is exactly what it says in the title. We're not going to make it. Let's learn how to die as a species. But then there's other perspectives and that it's our present way that, of life that's in danger. Um, and here we could turn to indigenous scholars, you know, people who are Native Americans, who have done a lot of writing on you know, the climate crisis from, the perspect from their perspective, saying, look, climate crisis is an apocalypse, but depending on who you ask, the apocalypse already happened in 1492 when colonization began. It's an interesting perspective, and it's something to keep in mind when we are incredibly worried about what might be crashing down around us and communities within our own country are saying, hey, first time. Then there's also ways that we might think about emerging new ways of living. So here we could point to Donna Haraway's book on what she calls the Thulu scene, um, where she talks about we need to change our way of even thinking about what we are, what life is, and live in these entangled relationships with nature. And then there's a, a writer named Evan Kirksey, who is a little bit more keyed into emerging si some emerging ecologies. What's the title of the book? I can link you it. I can link you a full copy. He looks at okay, what species are thriving in a changing environment? What species are not? How are there new ways of thinking of life on this planet that may or may not involve humans? But it's not as if all life on the earth is disappearing. There are, in fact, new forms of life coming into being. And now here's our all too brief overview of options for climate action. And here the guiding metaphor I want to give you is that we're looking at like topographical maps here when talking about climate action instead of looking at the actual landscapes. So 10,000 foot view, looking at the map of the thing, not the actual pictures of the thing itself. So first option that is really our present course is to do nothing. And what happens if we do nothing on climate change? Well, outcomes are uncertain, but all projections trend toward negative results, whether it's rising sea levels or, you know, fighting each other with knives over canned goods in about 60 years, you know, who knows? Then there's better options. I'd say the do nothing approach doesn't really work. But one better option would be this idea of degrowth, where what we do is we just decide we're going to cut back. We're not going to drive. We're not going to drive anymore. We're going to make air travel only for the essential. And we've seen a kind of degrowth in 2020 with the coronavirus, right? People stayed home. They didn't drive anywhere carbon emissions actually went down for a period of a few months, especially in the US. What also came with that? Some not so great economic impacts. And so we think of when we think of degrowth, it sounds really good on paper, but we have to ask who ends up becoming harmed by this? You know, who, you know, because degrowth comes with things like collapse of economy. Then there's green growth. And this is really the dream of the eco-moderns, but also the Green New Deal, right? It's this idea that we can build new systems that will help the planet instead of harm it. We can decouple from extractive technologies. And, you know, there's some wisdom there. There's a lot of money to be made, frankly, in terms of green technology. You know, you can, you can even save money now if you're going to do something like link up your house to solar panels. So green growth is an option. The question we need to ask is, how scalable is it? How do we do these things on a national and international model? And those are not easily answered questions. We could point out here that this is the eco-modern dream. And that also, some would say it doesn't go far enough. You know, in the article that I've linked to you, the writer says, if we want to just, you know, give people electric cars, that's not going to solve it. We need to do more. And we can also consider here the ideas of free market environmentalism in this category. I showed you the climate impact page that Amazon has put up. And that's largely the idea behind green growth, right? They want to continue to make money. Jeff Bezos understands that he can't be the richest man in the world if there's no one to be richer than. And so what do we do? We need to convert these businesses to green energy so that business can continue to happen. 
what about some other things? There's geoengineering. Um, geoengineering is a very broad category. The idea in general is that we create systems of technology that handle the climate crisis because radical solutions are necessary, especially because even if we were to just cut off carbon emissions now, you know, we went to net zero tomorrow, some damage is still baked into the system. I will link you an article about that as well. I actually have two in the vault for that. Then there's some specific solutions that are offered for green geoengineering, and some are more technological than others. There's these ideas of carbon capture systems, you know, big machines that will build to literally suck the carbon out of the air. Another suggestion that people have given is solar radiation management. Um, and there's different suggestions for this, some as radical as seeding the atmosphere with various chemicals to reflect solar radiation back. Um, then there's less technological solutions. I'm going to take a sip of coffee. And these are, in my mind, maybe a little bit more feasible because they've been done before. Things like large-scale tree planting operations. Yeah, that has happened now, is happening in the, is, is planned for the future and has happened in the past. Um, if you want to look at the Civilian Conservation Corps in this country during the Great Depression. We planted something like 3 billion trees in the state of Wisconsin alone. Surely we can do things like that again. Why do we need to get build these huge machines when nature has provided the technology that we need? It's a fair argument. Then people will also take that same argument and apply it to the ocean, saying, well, we can plant big seaweed farms between continents you know, on the ocean floor. And seaweed does suck up a lot of carbon. You know, it'll help cool the ocean down a little bit. It's a smart idea. Then, of course, I've thrown it in here as almost a joke, but there are people who have accepted it. You know, doomsday prepping. Stock up on your canned good. It's, it's already too late. Personally, I find that idea to be a little, I don't know, unhelpful. I think maybe we can take action anyway. And just because some climate change is already baked into the system does not mean that all of it is. Then there's a final idea of capacity building. How can we build systems that will last in a changing world? And this, when we get down to things like political policy, I'll link you another article. It's very interesting. If you just change the language around climate preparation, you know, you call it, instead of sustainability, you say like future proofing or something like that suddenly more people are all for it, even in areas where people do not believe in climate change. So capacity building is perhaps another solution, provided you do it in a way that does not offend people. The reality is that we probably needed many interlocking solutions, and that's why I gave you a copy of the Drawdown Review, because it is a publication that gives a lot of solutions addressing this multi-leveled problem. I think the work that the folks there put together is really smart. I would, I would encourage you to look through it. There's a lot there. Now, what about these ethics questions? So our sense of ethics is going to really impact the choices we make on climate policy. You know, we have our three classical perspectives here. And look, if you're a utilitarian, you need to ask, how do we bring the greatest good to the greatest number and the least harm to the lowest number? We know, for example, certain parts of the planet are going to be uninhabitable. Okay, so speaking of utility, how do we accommodate as many people living in the places of the planet that are still inhabitable? How do we come up with climate solutions that cause the smallest amount of economic impact? And then deontology will ask even different questions. Deontology's whole question is, what is the right thing to do regardless of the outcome? As in, applied to the climate, what would we do even if it was too late to reverse the climate crisis? Here we might say, okay, even if it's too late, the actions we would take to at least lessen things, at least promote the flourishing of other species, even after humans are not able to stay on this planet anymore, those would still be moral goods. They'd be worth pursuing as a species, as a society. And then virtue theory gets a little interesting here. I'm not sure how well it is equipped to deal with it. 
I've got one article that kind of goes into it a little bit. I'll link that to you as well. I'm going to have a lot of optional reading links this week. And I don't know. So Virtue needs to ask what excellence and flourishing is in an altered climate. You know, Aristotle's virtue ethics were very naturalist. You know, he believed that everything had a flourishing of its own. But then knowing that the world is going to be different, okay, what is flourishing for, say, birds and bees when their niche in the environment has changed or has disappeared? And then there's quite a few ethical problems we need to address. You know, every possible solution requires major changes on every level, you know, local, national, global, personal. And so we need to ask who stands to benefit and who is harmed by these changes. Things like degrowth, where we just cut back on everything that's causing harm. There are people who stand to lose everything there, and it's not typically the wealthy. You know, it's your average worker who drives a a more emitting car. However, it is also a small handful of corporations that cause the most environmental damage. But there's a lot of real people that work for those corporations. So how do we make sure that those people are taken care of if we just cut off the tap on climate change? And then we've talked about it a little bit in this lecture already. There's problems of migration here. No matter what, some places are going to be uninhabitable. So where do people live, you know, and how do we invite people to come live different places? If you think that current questions of human migration are already at, you know, kind of at fever levels of disagreement and horrifying politics, it's going to get worse there. Then how do you convince the general public to take action on something that realistically might not affect them, but will affect their children or grandchildren? that then becomes a question of ethics education for the general public. <coughs> finally, well, not finally, second to last, economic issues. You know, how do we ethically manage green energy? You know, how do we replace all the cars in this country? Somebody's got to pay for that, right? But how do we make sure we do that without someone profiteering off of the, you know, the death of our planet? It's a big ethical question. And finally, animal rights, which I think is one of the more interesting ones in several of the things I have to send to you this week, we can see that agriculture makes up a huge portion of carbon emissions, but solutions are not super clear here. You know, and what I mean by that is the animal rights folks would have us, you know, release a lot of the animals that we hold in captivity but we know that they wouldn't necessarily survive. And so we, maybe what we do is we just hold them in captivity until they die. But the problem is there that they're still going to continue to produce carbon. But I don't think anybody who is an animal rights activist is going to advocate for the mass execution of all of these animals we hold in captivity. That's what they're against anyway, in terms of meat farming, right? And so how would we manage a sustainable transition away from factory farms and mass agriculture that contributes about 10% of carbon emissions on this planet while still giving these animals the respect they deserve, while still making sure that the poorest of the poor among humans still have a adequate food source, it is not an easy question to answer. So that's what I have for you in this lecture. What we're going to do in the next one is kind of talk about some different perspectives. Um, our discussion posted this week is going to deal more in climate change. So let's put a pin in that. I will see you in the next lecture, and I will make sure that I get all those optional readings ready for you as well. Have a good day, everybody.